Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, verse uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he's in jail for the word of God. This is a prison, one of Paul's prison epistles. Beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation. Wherein you are called. Now this chapter is going to focus on the new life. Now that you're saved, you are a new creature. Get away from that which is old. That's what this chapter is going to focus. You know, I beseech you. The vocation. It's your job. It's your, your occupation. People are watching you. You are a Christian. Your conduct. Many people, if you live a, a poor life, will use you as, as a excuse. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, and forbear, forbearing one another in love. So it's not lifting yourself up. It's not pride. It's not exalting. It's long suffering. Enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unify together in the name and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, not all men are the same. They have different hobbies. They have different things. But, but the doctrine, the teachings of the Bible, we should all come together and be united. And even that we're not. Because we're going to read in a minute. It says, there is one body, the church. And one spirit, the Holy Spirit. But Paul said it to the Corinthians that there's another spirit. So is that a contradiction? No. There is one Holy Spirit and there are many other other spirits out there. We Today as a family we read there's a spirit of jealousy. Is my wife being faithful? I don't know. I don't understand. What is that? That's not a good healthy spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. Who is above all, through all, and in you all. One. One. One God, one Lord, one faith, one Father. One Spirit. And 200 modern Bibles. Does that sound correct? Do you think after reading this passage, chapter 4, there's one, 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 and then, oh yeah, you can have whatever, how many Bibles you want? I think there's one Bible. Purified seven times. What would the modern Bibles say there? And I don't care to know what they say. I'm just saying. It is one, one, one unity, and you got modern Bibles out there to the fifth fold. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gifts of, of Christ. So grace is given to you by measure on what you do in your faith. The more you adhere to the Word of God, the more faith you're going to get. The more you do not adhere to the Word of God, the less faith you're going to get. 
So when you start off as a newborn Christian, your faith is, hey, I'm no longer going to hell. So you've been saved 20, 25 years, 30 years, and look at all the faith you have now that you, by reading your Bible, by studying your Bible, by listening to preaching, by having the right Bible, what is all the faith you have now? Man, I'm going to a place where there's going to be no more pain. I'm going to a place where there's no more sorrow. I'm going to a place I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to go to a place I'm going to see Jesus Christ. There's a city waiting for me. There's a mansion being built for me. That's all faith. And by reading and studying the Bible, it's like, wow. It's not just going to hell no more. There's more than that. And it grows as you grow. You want to stop? Anytime you can stop your grace and your faith. Just don't do what God tells you to do. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, Jesus Christ, when he ascended on high, Acts 1, he led captivity captive. All right? When he died, the graves were opened up, the Old Testament saints. They were captive in Abraham's bosom. He let them go. He let them free. He said to that dying thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And gave gifts unto men. I don't understand that. The gifts. Now that he ascended. What is it but that he, Jesus Christ, also descended, gone down, first into the lower parts of the earth, and scripture with scripture, Jesus went into hell. He crossed that gulf over into Abraham's bosom. A lot of people say, oh no, Jesus didn't go to hell. Well, what do you do there? He that descended is the same, also that ascended up from above all heavens. That, so that Jesus Christ in, in Acts chapter 1, who ascended to the Father, at the right hand of the Father, went through the three heavens to get there, went down to the heart of this earth. As he said, Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of, of hell, in the heart of the belly of that well. So must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Where hell is. Christ Jesus not only paid for our sins, but he took our sins to hell and left them in hell. What other man or woman could have done that for us? No one got out of hell. But Jesus did. That he might fulfill, that he might fill all things. He gave some apostles, they're gone. There's three qualifications for the apostles again. They have to have been baptized at John's baptism. You can't do that today. John's dead. You have to live and be with the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Evidently Paul was. Because he calls himself apostle. You have to see the resurrected Christ. That fulfills Paul in the road of Damascus. So you can come up with all your worldly, I've seen Jesus in the clouds. I've seen Jesus in my toes. You're still not an apostle because you were never baptized with John's baptism. You never walked and talked with Jesus during his ministry. So the apostles are gone. And some prophets, like I said yesterday, mentioned a prophet. I'm a prophet. I can tell a man where he's going to go when he dies. Based upon what he does with the Bible. I am in prophecy of what the Bible says. I can read and teach the book of Revelation and be a prophet. But I can't tell you lottery numbers. I can't tell you how many children you're going to have. I can't do that. And some evangelists, those men that travel around church to church, encouraging and lifting up and aiding the churches and the pastors thereof. They're still around today. And some pastors, that's the man head of the church, and teachers, that's the man that's in the church. He's not the pastor, but he's a teacher. We call them Sunday school teachers. Why do we have verse 11? For the perfecting of the saints. 
God wants you perfected. God wants you perfect. That's why he gave you evangelists and pastors and teachers and prophets. We don't have apostles. The apostles have written us some of the epistles in our New Testament book, and that's it. But they're done today. They're gone. For the work of the ministry, threefold, perfecting the saints, the work of the ministry, and for edifying of the body of Christ. It's the reason why we have verse 11. You are supposed to be under men that will teach and guide you. Now some don't. It's, it's not the perfecting of the saints. Their ministry. Their work in the ministry is not that of God. And they don't edify the body of Christ. They're failures. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. That would be the rapture. You're supposed to keep on perfecting yourself, working in ministry, edifying the body of the Christ till you die or till the church is gathered as one. That's the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Well, that perfect man, is, is that the perfect man is when we're dead and raptured. And yet, perfect in the Bible does not mean 100% completely sinless. It means you have achieved the ability that God has given you. At that moment, you are pleasing God, then you're perfected. Then we fall into sin and we become unperfected. Unto this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's coming a time that... <clears throat> We will be 100% with Christ. And I mean with Christ. I mean, we're going to be with, with Jesus Christ. But the body of Christ will be 100%. And that happens after the judgment seat of Christ. When all our sins have been burnt up. And all the crowns have been passed out. At that moment, are we perfected as one unity? There'll be no more schism. There'll be no more fighting. There'll be no more gossiping. We will be the sinless bride of Jesus Christ. 100%. We're not that today. That we henceforth no more children. Tossed to and fro. And carried about with every wind of doctrine. <clears throat> we're supposed to grow and we're not supposed to fall or be deceived like the Galatian church was. That's an act of childness, Paul just called that. When you fall for the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses, you are a child. You have not grown. You have not endured to study to show thyself approved unto God. You have showed yourself to be a failure before God. Because if you study the Bible, if you get in the Bible and get right in the Bible, you will not see that yourself in these deceivers, these religions, these occults, because you will know. How will you know that? You'll be able to judge them by the word, by what God says. By the slay of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people out there who want you to turn away from God as that serpent turned Eve away from God. And as you're supposed to grow, as you're supposed to have pastors, and teachers, and evangelists, the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, and the edifying body of Christ, so you do not end up in an occult. You do not end up like Demas who walks the way. You become like a mark. You turned away, but you came back profitable for service mark turned away but the final words of paul was he was profitable he was been perfected and that's what god wants from us it's a shameful thing for a born again bible christian to fall off and be deceived in baptist churches too when you got a man in a Baptist church be behind a pulpit who is deceiving you and you're falling for it. And like the Corinthians, Paul said to the Corinthians, children, you're carnal. I can't even get you off the breast. I can't get you off the, the milk. You, you, you won't grow. You're not even ready for rice cereal yet. 
And this is what Paul is mentioning to the Ephesian church is grow. Don't be deceived. But speaking the truth in love. And the people will accuse you of, it's not love. You have no love. Ma'am, when I, or man, mister, you speak like a woman. When I tell you about Jesus Christ, and that you're going to die and go to hell without him, that's love because I don't have to say anything. God has never demanded me with with fire from the sky say, you must preach to those people. I don't have to. Now I'm commanded to. And when I stand there or somebody comes knocking on your door or somebody hands you a gospel tract or at lunch someone take a time with a Bible while you're eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich and tell you about Jesus Christ, that's love. When a fellow Christian will come up and put your arms around you with a Bible and say, you know, you're not doing right. That's love. May grow up. Mark that up. May grow up. You may come from a babe in Christ to Paul the aged. God wants you to grow. There is no room, and I know this word has been tainted that. There is no room for spiritual retardedness for a Christian. We all have the ability to grow. A spiritual Christian retard is by choice. You choose to be retarded, frame from growing of your own will. Because the Bible says, grow up, may grow up. Unto him all things which is the head, even Christ. Problem is, you know what? Some churches, they have a head. And it's not Christ. It's the pastor. It's the deacon board. It's the women. And any two-headed creature. And there have been two-headed creatures. They don't live long. They're a mon monstrosity. They're an uh, uh, oddness to nature. And it doesn't survive. There's not to be two heads in the church. Christ is to be the head. From whom the whole body, Christ, the church, fitly, right, fitly, right, rightly joined together and compacted, pressed together by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of of every part make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love you got a knee bone that knee bone has a specific need it cannot do what your shoulder bone does you can rotate your arm 360 degrees you can't do that with your knee you try to rotate your knee 360 you try to get yourself out of position you're going to break a bone you're going to undo that joint. You got to realize where you fit in the in the bride of Christ. Where you fit in the church. Where God has you to be. Get in that place and do it to the best of ability. Never mind what the eyeballs are doing. Never mind what the big toe is doing. Who cares about the pinky? Who cares about the belly button? You find your spot in the, in the bride of Christ and you do it. And whatever part of the of the church you are, if, if you preach on the street and not knocking on doors, you're knocking on doors, you're not handing out gospel tracts, whatever you are, where God wants you, you fit. You're in the right place. And you press together to do right. Listen, you can't do everything in the church. You can't be in every position. Find where God wants you. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, unsaved, <clears throat> in vanity of their mind. And having the understanding, the vanity, darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Well, look at that. There are Gentiles. Who are alienated from God because their heart is dark. They're not saved. They're lost. 
they have no nothing to do with God. No, whatever religion, whatever they believe, they think they're right with God. And God said, no, you're not. You're alienated. And there's a wall between them, like America wants to build a wall. There's a wall. You're not going to get over that wall into glory because you have not done what God's told you to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. Who being, <clears throat> excuse me, who being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness, and to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's their motive. It's the desire of the flesh, the five senses. When you were lost, your whole life was yourself. No thought of God. Okay, you had religion. Well, you had a God that pleased your flesh. You didn't have the almighty, all-holy God of the Bible. Because you would not have religion. Because God is not religion. And you serve the God of sin. And not the God of the Bible. You were darkened. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him. And have been taught by him. As the truth in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation where we talked about before. This is not talk. This is your life, your conduct. The old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You're saved now. You're a new creature, the Bible said. Put off that old man. Put off those sins. You're no longer a Gentile. You're no longer supposed to be serving those dumb idols. You're not supposed to be under the law. You're supposed to be a, a signed, sealed child of God by faith. In the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, do right. Stay right. And be renewed, renewed in the spirit of your mind by reading the word. That ye put on the new man. It's the old it's the old Adam versus the new Adam. You have a new birth, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what you are today as a born again Christian. You are righteousness. You are true holiness. Throw that other stuff away in the garbage and live right. Wherefore, putting away lying. No more lies. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. You better speak the truth as a Christian. You don't make up stories. For we are members one of another. You're not supposed to be lying to the brethren. That is not good Christian fellowship. That is not good Christian conduct. That is not edifying the church when you tell a little white lie to make everybody laugh. That's not edifying. That's a lie. That's Satan, John 8, 44. Be ye angry. Okay, I love that one. Never give place to the devil. Let him... I wonder that's what the modern Bible says. Be ye angry. I can never give place to the devil. No, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. There's nothing wrong with getting angry. Be ye angry. I am angry that occults will grab people. I am angry that Americans will, will, will defile all Americans. I am angry that the that, 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 uh, 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 capitalism will, will steal from you. I'm angry. But sin not. You can be you can be angry, but you're not the sin. When you now what what is the difference between angry and sin? That's between you and God because everyone's different. I can tell you one thing right now be angry, but don't kill anybody. Moses got angry, he killed the man and hit him. And you can probably read other uh, places in the Bible. David got angry with uh, Uriah. He wouldn't go home. So he had him killed. That's wrong. Be angry. Don't open up your big mouth 
We'll give you time to cool down. Don't be hasty with your anger. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, I remember my grandfather teaching me that. I remember he always told me, he said, as far as marriage, he would tell me with this Bible verse, never go to bed angry. You've sinned against God. If you got wrath, it better end when the sun sets. And it better not be there when the sun rises. Get it over with. Mark chapter 3 verse 5. Neither give place to the devil. Well, what's the devil? Run back to the lion, verse 25. John 8, 44. He's a liar. He's the murderer. That anger could cause murder. Well, that'd be giving place to the devil. We've seen two things in these two verses. Lion and murder, John 8, 44. Don't give in to that. That's Satan. When a man lies, John 8, 44, your father is Satan. You better be careful. I'm just trying to warn you people. I'm trying to tell you that, that judgment seat of Christ is coming. I know I got one person right now in mind with these lies, and they're, they're building up. You'll be sorry. Let him that stole, I used to preach this one in prison. Let him that stole, Steal no more. Knock it off. You're saved. You're a Christian now. You better not steal. But rather, here's what you're supposed to do. Let him labor. Get a job. Thief, get a job. Working with his hands, the thing which is good. Get a job. Get your hands busy. Put your hands to labor, not to steal it. That he might have get that he may have to give to him that need it. Get yourself a job because there may be somebody in church that needs something that you will be able to have money and resources from that job that you can give to that Christian to help him. What a complete reversal. What a complete repentance for a man that has stolen things. Is get yourself a job. Do not steal. Because you may have the opportunity by God to help someone else. So there's no condemnation to the guy who is still stolen. If he's repented, gotten right, and is able to help somebody. See, the sins are no longer under you and over you if you repent and get right. And the thing is, what we're learning here is now replace a bad with a good habit. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. You want to quit drinking? Find something good to replace it. As with smoking, as with a bad habit, bite and nails, whatever you got in your life as a habit that is a sin. In order to get rid of that sin, don't just say, okay, it's gone. You got a cavity now. Fill that cavity with something good. Say, Lord, I've got this sin in my life. Lord, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass out gospel tracts in replace of that sin. I'm going to fill sin with something righteous. I'm going to read my Bible. Every time I got that thing, that, oh, I want that desire. Lord, will you help me to open the Bible instead of doing that? Get something good. Your fingers, if they're causing you to steal in trouble, not only get yourself a job, start knitting. Start writing a journal. Start doing something. Something good. Something that can give God the pleasure and God the credit that you will get a reward for it and not wood, hay, or stubble and get ashes. Replace something bad that is something good. That's what you ought to do. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now that's speaking. Let nothing filthy come out of your mouth. But that which is good, see that again, corrupt, good. Take the corrupt out, fill it with good. Which is good to the use of edifying, 
Lord, I'm not going to use filthy communication anymore. I'm going to use my mouth to edify somebody else. You got to take the bad and fill it with the good. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Look at the things you get with, with corrupt communication if you use it for good. You can also give grace. What a filthy mouth cannot give. You become a benefit of God if you were to give up your sin and replace it with something God wants you to do. And you can be rewarded where you will not be rewarded for your sins. You can give up your sins by seeking God for something good. And with all that, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make him upset. And along with that, you can quench the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 5, 19. You can get a big bucket of water and throw the fire out the Holy Spirit. I, I was in a church one time, and we get guest preachers come in. And there'd be, I mean, the message would be great. The atmosphere is great. The Holy Spirit has been there. It is work. And that idiot preacher will get up after the message and tweak the message that was just preached. I used to call that fire water. My wife would, 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 would giggle. I said, oh, here comes the fire water. And would douse the message that was just preached because he had to have the authority he had to say something. You can quench the Holy Spirit. You can put him out. You can grieve the Holy Spirit right here. You can upset the Holy Spirit. You can also, I advise you not to resist the Holy Spirit. Acts 7.51. You can tell the Holy Spirit, and my family has seen this with our family men. We have seen people week after week after week will not do what the Holy Spirit said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know their outcome. As a Christian, all right, keep on stealing. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. You are quenching the Holy Spirit. You are grieving the Holy Spirit, and you will not get a reward. When you sin, you are grieving the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. The Holy Spirit does not want you to do that. Because what you do, you subject the Holy Spirit to. And you are quenching the Holy Spirit. He can't work fully when you got sin in your life. And you are resisting the Holy Spirit because you know you're not supposed to be doing that. So you are hindering the Holy Spirit of full work. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You are put inside of an envelope. And that thing is licked and sealed by Jesus Christ, the gospel. No one is not even allowed to touch that envelope that you're in. Never mind, open it. That envelope is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and no one but the Lamb can open that up. No one but the Lamb can erase the name, and when your name is written in there, it cannot be erased. Satan can never touch that book to remove your name. You are sealed, and with a seal in the Old Testament, was they take a, the ring, a ring on their finger, and they would dip it in wax and say, This is an authority. You are signed by God, by God's ring, the God of all creation. Say, that's mine. So it's it's a two-way explain of a seal. No one's ever going to break that open. No one's ever going to take me out. And I have on me the certification of God. I'm his. Let all bitterness. Well, we had a little good in verse, right? But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. <laughs> Paul's re summoning it up. Just in case you didn't get it the first time. Be put away from you. Be put away. Throw it out. But get something good. Put away from you with all malice the spirit of revenge. And be ye, okay, now, put away the clamor, put away the anger, put away the evil. Be ye kind. That's the good. 
the kind and forgiving and tender heart will get rid of the anger, the clamor, evil speaking. You know what the problem with some people, why they quit doing good? Because they never feel the good for the bad in their life. There's an emptiness that needs to be filled. Be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving. That forgiving goes against malice because malice is a spirit of revenge. Forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake. Look at that. Christ's sake. That used to be a curse when I grew up. In the house I grew up, you used to hear Christ's sake. And it wasn't good. For Christ's sake has forgiven you. How are you to love the brethren as Christ loved the brethren? He forgave you, right? Yeah. And you forgive. You're angry with him? Yeah. Is God angry with you anymore? No. Well... You speaking evil against those, those those people? Yeah. God speaking evil of you? Yeah. Be kind. Tender hearted. Fill again the bad with something good. Take what God cannot bless in your life and find something that God can reward you and say, well done. That's the way it is.